Welcome to episode 30 of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. This month I had the honor and pleasure to speak to Dr. LaRose Paris. Dr. Paris is an associate professor of Africana Studies at Lehman College. She is a member of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, a scholar, a literary and critical theorist, and author of the book Being Apart, Theoretical and Existential Resistance in Africana Literature, which I can't recommend enough. It's an, it's an awesome book and amazing scholarship. In this episode, LaRose spoke about education, Eurocentrism, creolization, representation, David Walker, decolonizing decolonization, and survivance. The conversation jumps into an initial discussion we were having on hip-hop music, but first, here's a brief jingle by a fellow Channel Zero Network member, and thank you to Awareness for the music. The Final Straw is a weekly anarchist radio show. It's fucking awesome, and you're never going to hear me say fucking awesome on our show, because we're FCC regulated. There's a a black part of my heart that that just flutters when you you talk like that. Uh, (laughs) Talk, then more yelling. It's a weird sort of, like, nice in a way, but also can get kind of crushing at times. The final straw radio dot no So a lot of songs now are very autobiographical of, yeah. themse- of rappers talking about themselves, which is okay. But when you step out and story tell, I think it tells so much about you and history and it serves a lot okay. of information at once. I, I don't see that as much now. Well, that's the thing. They used to use the narrative format to really continue the oral tradition of maintaining the history, the suppressed history of black people. And that's why that's why hip hop is so important for that. And they're not doing it as much. They're just like you said, rhyming about their lives. And that's that's that has its own um, merits. But it's not to me as much a continuation of the oral history that we used to get from, for example, like you mentioned, KRS One. Like, I mean, his whole, so much of his early catalog was just about Malcolm. You know what I mean? And yeah. so many, and the, those, they really, that was for them. And I think part of it too is because I'm talking about a generation of rappers like me who were born in the in the civil rights Black Power era. And if you were born during that time and grew up in the 70s, of course that's what you're going to rap about. I mean, if you had parents who were in any at all in any way conscious and, you know, raising you to understand your history and your place in the world, that's why they that's why all of them rapped about that. That's why it was important for them to talk about Malcolm and the Panthers and, you know, fighting the power. You know what I mean? Like there's a whole different sensibility that I feel like these younger rappers, many of them are just removed from that history. So as much as they try, it's just not as immediate to them. You know what I mean? It seems like a distant path to them. Whereas for many of us who grew up during that time, it's, it's yes, it's the past, but we see the connections between that past and the present reality we're living in, you know, with the resurgence of um, literally white supremacy being sanitized and it's always been normalized, but now it's really being sanitized. You know what I mean? Yeah. And especially in terms of the violence against black people. It is, when I think about this current administration and the fact that Biden is not more ahead in the polls than he is, it tells me clearly that so many white Americans are so comfortable and think it's perfectly fine to have an avowed white supremacist in the White House. The fact that more white people are not, so, and even some people of color, because you see the crazy Trump supporters who are black and Latinx, you see them. Um, But the fact that more people aren't alarmed by what's happening and how he's transformed this presidency, not only into a citadel, really, of white supremacy, but also authoritarianism. I feel like American people are asleep. And I know part of it's the pandemic and people are struggling to get by. I get it. But we, we are dealing with a serious crisis in this country, and it's alarming to me that Biden isn't more ahead, of, more ahead in the polls than he is. Yeah. I mean, yes, he's ahead, but to me, it's not enough. The fact mm-hmm. that we have a, somebody who wants to be a dictator in the White House and people aren't, aren't concerned about that? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It really is. It's, it's sickening. What he, is, what he is doing to the, the executive office is unprecedented. Yeah. The fact right. that people aren't more up in arms is, is terrifying. It's astonishing. And- Isn't it? 
It's the, the, uh, yeah, the amount of just nihilism and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like you said, negative nihilism and coupled with white supremacy is, is just, it's just so troubling. And mm -hmm. that's really why I feel like the importance of your work and what you were just saying ties into my, my first question. Okay. Your parents immigrated from Jamaica to the Bronx. Yeah, we all did. I was a baby when we came. Okay, awesome. And I was wondering if, if you could speak about their influence on you with them mm -hmm. being activists and their black nationalist perspective, um, mm -hmm. along with the Bronx, and you said you had moved away. And when you first started challenging U.S. hegemony, Eurocentrism, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. colonial narratives? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I would say my parents' influence on me is, has been immeasurable. They were my most significant and most important teachers, most devoted teachers, and most conscious teachers. Because, I mean, my father was a professor, actually. He left academia, but he was a political science professor. My mother was an educator on the primary school level. But the, the most important thing is that they had a very strong belief in the importance of black nationalism as a philosophy, as a unifying um, ideology for black people around the globe. And yes, in, definitely in part because they were, you know, we are from the island of Jamaica, um, but also the fact that they were very, I would say, global citizens in the sense that even though we were, we come from poor families. My parents came from very poor families, but they valued education. And part of the valuing education meant that they, my grandparents, made it their priority to encourage my parents to apply for scholarships, to study abroad. And they did. They got scholarships. They studied abroad. My mother went to nursing school in England. My father went to um, get his undergraduate degree at University of South Dakota, because he got a full scholarship. And they came to their uh, worldview definitely through being Caribbean people. And as Caribbean people, the legacy of colonialism is something that is a lived reality. For them, when they went to school, it's the classic example that's in many books. For example, in Kamal Brathwaite's essay called History of the Voice, that I write about in the fourth chapter of my book. He talks about the colonial legacy and the imprint that's made on young children in under a colonial regime in the Anglophone Caribbean, uh, learning about, for example, the snowflakes on the hills or reading, you know, uh, making identification with Shakespearean characters and mm -hmm. learning about this foreign history that's been transplanted to their island environment and at the same time, the simultaneous degradation of local local history, local culture, Afro-Caribbean culture, not learning about, for example, the slave um, uprisings, the Maroon, the Maroon Wars, not learning about Nanny of the Maroons, not, who's a national hero now. But back in the, my, my parents were in school in the 1940s, it was all about the colonial education and valorizing the, for example, the Tudor dynasty or the other, any of the royal houses of England. And so that was the history that was transplanted. And because my parents had that in their background, when they got older, they knew it was something, you know, after being exposed to the thinking of Marcus Garvey and knowing about his international movement the Back to Africa movement. And, you know, even though it was definitely calling for a physical return to the motherland, it was also calling for, equally importantly, a psychological return, a historical and cultural return. And that is what really um, made an impact on them in their thinking and in the, the way they thought of themselves. To think of black people in the Caribbean as just one part of a larger African descendant family, and that shapes them, and they pass that down to us. We never, we always, I should say, thought of ourselves as just one wing of a larger African family that was separated, of course, through the you know uh, European slave trade and colonialism, but 
we never saw that as the end of the story. Because if any black nationalist will tell you that, yes, those were the circumstances of our separation, not only from our motherland, but from our extended racial family. But the hope and the, and the dream in some ways of black nationalism is that we still strive to maintain connections with our immediate Caribbean motherland, with our um, somewhat removed African motherland, and with our brothers and sisters throughout the globe. We, we were taught to always understand ourselves as part of a larger racial, cultural family, and that the bonds that we create with other people in the African diaspora are bonds that we should always value. And they had, a, they had an enormous impact. When we were children, we were homeschooled. There was no word for it when we were growing up. We just, you know, it was just, oh, okay, we have to do more, some more work for mom and dad. We used to have to write reports. We used to have to literally, on top of our schoolwork, on the weekends, write reports on Marcus Garvey, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Toussaint Louverture. So that was my parents' way of showing us this, our struggle for freedom, justice, and equality, as Malcolm would say, our struggle for human dignity is a global struggle. So we never separated, for example, the struggle of the Maroons in Jamaica from the struggle of, let's say, Nat Turner in South Carolina. It was one and the same, because we were fighting against the hegemony of white supremacy on a global scale, albeit in different parts of the globe, but the struggle was the same. And that's how our parents indoctrinated us to see that, you know, whoever we're studying about in our weekend lessons, um, for example, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, we saw that as the same the same force for liberation that, in, that inspired Nat Turner, that inspired Gabriel Prosser and Denmark Vesey, that inspired Harriet Tubman. So we were at a young age taught about the global struggle of people of African descent. And we, and it gave us such strength and pride because we didn't get that education in our, in our public schools, um, especially once we moved to Long Island. We didn't get that education at all. So it gave us a strength. And I remember, um, for example, I was a very shy child when I was young, and more so when we moved to Long Island. And I I became very shy and somewhat withdrawn. But whenever, let's say I had a classmate, um, I think she was Irish-American. Her name was Cheryl Cosgrove. I'll never forget. It was in fifth grade, and she made some comment about how all black people love fried chicken and watermelon. You know, some stereotypes some stereotypical comments. And I said, that's a stereotype. And that, that's, you're so ignorant, and it's not even true. I said something like that to her. And she, I'll never forget the look on her face, because I was someone who was so shy and reserved. But when it came to matters of principle or standing up for myself in terms, if I felt that I was being discriminated against based on race, I had a strength. And that, that came from my, my parents and my upbringing. Mm. Because in other ways, I would, you know, I was just, very quiet and studious, but if something came up and it was a, you know, a political issue, but, you know, veiled in, in, a, in the form of a stereotype or an insult, I never let it slide. And that became, that was part of what my parents did for me. They gave me that strength. And in some ways, I wasn't even aware I had it. But I knew that whenever something came up, I would stand up for myself. I would make, I would make a statement and that came from my parents. They had everything that I do. When I think about the work that I've done and the path I've chosen in academia, it's because of my parents. And I can never really thank them enough um, because they gave me a gift that really is priceless. And that is a sense of strength and a sense of identity. And, you know, the other, like I said, the other two teachers in the house in in the acknowledgments of my book, were Bob Marley, because we played his music nonstop, and Malcolm X, because my father had all of Malcolm's speeches on vinyl. So I used to hear the the voices of these men in particular in this case. I mean, of course, there were women, you know, that I came to revere as well. But when I think of the immediate influences within the household, my mother, my father, and then Malcolm and Bob, because those were the voices that I heard reinforcing the messages that my parents gave me. Thank you for sharing that. And 
Uh, speaking of, of Brathwaite, it sounds like the education they were giving you, the extra education was really going counter to what Brathwaite was saying of the Caribbean education, which was, as you quoted him, uh, the language of the conquistador and yeah. introducing Shakespeare and Jane Austen, which were these, these colonized models and people were forced to learn things that had no relevance to themselves. That's they right. Countering that education. That's right, because they because they got that colonial education and they knew the faults within it. They knew the faults within it because they they really understood and appreciated and wanted to propagate the message of Garvey, which also ran counter to the colonial model. So because they were Garveyites in some senses, I mean, they didn't think he was a perfect man, but his message of black unity and self-determination and knowledge of self and knowledge of black history resonated for them very, very strongly. And they knew in many ways that a black nationalist um, ideology would really counter, like you say, the effect of that colon of the colonized mind. They did not want us to grow up with a colonized psychology because they knew, they recognized that that's how they were inculcated within the school system, to have a colonial perspective, never to value themselves um, intrinsically as Afro-Caribbean people, but instead consider themselves subjects, loyal subjects of the British crown. And they recognized, they recognized the flaws in that thinking, and they, mm-hmm. they didn't want us to have any of that. So absolutely, that, you know, like Brathwaite, they wanted to run, uh, give us messages to counter that, so that we would have a strong sense of self, and that we we would we wouldn't succumb, we wouldn't succumb to any sort of you know white supremacist thinking, because as you know well, you don't have to be white to support white supremacy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the the example of these Trump supporters who are people of color, they're the perfect example. Thanks for thanks for sharing that story and. This this ties into uh, my next question, which is on Western philosophers. And uh, to set up this question, I'd like to read a quote from Being Apart. You you write, in this regard, the Enlightenment writings of Hume, Kant, and Jefferson, and later Hegel, provided the formal discursive means to sanitize chattel slavery and perpetuate the capitalist exploitation of the enslaved. Mm -hmm. And... As you know, Western philosophers, including John Locke, who was invested in the Royal African Company, wrote mm-hmm. the South Carolina Slave Constitution, uh, Voltaire, who blamed the slave trade on Africans, mm-hmm. uh, Kant, who had a racial hierarchy that, mm-hmm. uh, as you write, inspired Hume's footnote that you write about, mm-hmm. he played into this horrific hegemony that, that is ongoing, as you were saying. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the tactic of creolization which has been beneficial to bringing out the good ideas of philosophers while also holding them accountable Mm -hmm. and introducing critical philosophy. I was wondering if you could speak about this topic. And then also, I didn't want to put this into a binary, but the tactic of creolization on one hand, but also just the usefulness and the need of just rediscovering or centering solely uh, African, Africana philosophers, indigenous philosophers, or women mm-hmm. philosophers on their own who have been hidden mm-hmm. from history? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. The, the thing about the creolizing process, and this is what uh, Jane Anna Gordon stresses in her book, Creolizing Political Theory, is that in the creolizing process, what you're doing is looking at thematic, ideological currents that run in common between or amongst thinkers that you would not necessarily place together. And she does that with in her work on Rousseau and Fanon. Mm-hmm. Now, she calls it the creolizing, a creolizing methodology because of the history of creolization in the new world. And within that process of uh, combining or mixing people from disparate racial, ethnic, cultural backgrounds, for example, enslaved Africans, perhaps Irish and Scottish indentured workers, the planter class from England, and before the extinction of the indigenous populations, the Tainos and the Arawaks, 
um, and perhaps the Spanish as well. In that, in that creolizing process, she argues that these new identities, new cultural forms arise that prior to the creation of the new world, no one would have imagined. So she takes that, the, the sort of, um, you would say, the unexpected or perhaps the heretical, and applies that to theory. So you could look at, for example, the work of, in, in, like if I want to use David Hume, for example, you would look at his work alongside the very person he disparages in that quote, Francis Williams, hmm. the first black, um, Afri person of African descent to graduate from, I think it was Cambridge. Mm -hmm. So in a creolizing methodology, you would look at Hume's work alongside Francis Williams and then create some sort of, not necessarily a parallel at all, because they are, they are in your words, binary figures. But you could look at that work side by side and then mine some sort of theory or idea to discuss the development of or the history of ideas in 1700s British society and culture. You could use those two very disparate figures, and in many cases they're contrary, specifically because of what Hume wrote about Francis Williams, and then arrive at some sort of idea or hypothesis about, for example, the influence of people, of African people in 1700s British society mm -hmm. and look at, on the one hand, Francis Williams, who made amazing strides and contributions as the first African person to graduate from Cambridge and who was in some circles valued for that contribution. And then on the flip side, you have him saying, denying this man's accomplishments and claiming that he could only, in effect, act as a human parrot, parroting that he couldn't think, that he was just parroting back whatever he learned by virtue of what Hume would consider his great British education. And then you could point to the flaws in Hume's argument, because Francis Williams was not held to a different standard. He earned his diploma from Cambridge because he fulfilled his, the requirements of the degree. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you could actually write something about the persistence of anti-black racism in the face of black achievement. You see? Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that would come out of that. And then the other question, can you just remind me the other part of the question? It wasn't quite a, it was, I didn't want to turn it into like a binary with the question, mm -hmm. but uh, like on one hand, uh, which you explained very eloquently, the, the value of creolization, but also the um, the renewed focus that there needs to be and there is and is ongoing of rediscovering or mm. centering Africana philosophers, indigenous mm. philosophers, oh, yeah. or women philosophers just on their own. Oh, yeah. Well, this is the thing. Um, like, I, as I mentioned, creolization can be very fruitful. It can yield unexpected results. But I agree with you that I don't, I do not think that it should be a substitute for really foregrounding the work of indigenous uh, philosophers, philosophers from the global south, philosophers of color. I don't think it should supplant that very important work at all. For example, right now I'm the co-editor of a series put out by Roman and Littlefield called Living Existentialism. And what we're doing with that series is really trying to share with the reading public First, the primary idea is that existentialism is a living philosophy, and attached to that primary idea is that it has been a living philosophy in the thought of Africana, indigenous women thinkers, thinkers from the global south, even prior to existentialism's rise to prominence in, for example, post-war European society. We argue that these existential principles, for example, of being and freedom and agency, all of that, all of those themes have been present in the writings of thinkers of color since, you know, as early as the 1700s, perhaps. So definitely, while creolization is useful and instructive, also really critically looking at the philosophical canon outside 
of its European uh, influence and its hegemony is really critical for understanding the history of ideas amongst the world's people. Because we have to, we have to shift. This is one of the, the, I think, the most effective slogans of the Caribbean Philosophical uh, Association is shifting the geography of reason. Reason meaning logic, re- reason meaning philosophy, reason meaning thought and rationality. We have to shift that geography away from Europe. We cannot continually have that Eurocentric belief that anything of value has to come from the European continent, any thinking of value, any ideas of value, any systems of thought or systems of ideas. We have to look at the world's people in their and our full humanity. And if you're looking at a people in their full humanity, that means you respect their contribution to the world of ideas. And that's why we have to under. that's why we... In CPA, the Caribbean Philosophical Association, and in my work as the co-editor for Living Existentialism, we continually strive to highlight and underscore the importance of respecting and valuing thought, you know, from all corners of the globe and from women, from all people. And once you do that and you're open to that, then, of course, you say, well, the human experience is a complex one, and of course people of other races have written about themes such as being and freedom and agency and responsibility. You know, once, you, once people are able to take off those blinders, once they're able to look at the fallacy of Eurocentric thinking and also its li- inherent limitations, then they can really open themselves up to reading the works of great thinkers from, you know, all corners of the globe, especially people of color and women. You know, once you're really embracing the human experience and the humanity of people, if you move away from the narratives of dehumanization that have consistently and systematically labeled the work of people of color and women as inferior, then you're really opening yourself up to act, to real learning. Okay, because if we're talking about what learning is supposed to be and education, you know, coming from the word to edify, to improve, to make better, then ideas are made better when they're not restricted to coming from one source. When we value the the totality of the human experience in, in different forms and different thought systems from different areas of the globe, um, from people of color and from women, you then you're really opening yourself up to a tremendous amount of learning. Mm-hmm. A tremendous and, amount. And that's why I, I, I just want to honor the work that you do and that the CPA does. And it's, oh, it's well. very valuable and I, I appreciate it. And it's, it's amazing work. And oh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank it's, you. And yeah. It's, it's, it, this, that, that kind of ties into my next question. Mm-hmm. And in my last podcast episode, I spoke to uh, Brenda Child, Mm -hmm. the Ojibwe scholar, and she had written an article about how Ken Burns, you know, the historian for PBS, consistent erasure of uh, indigenous history, even in Mm -hmm. his 10-hour documentaries, he manages to not cover indigenous history. At Um, all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you you cite uh, that the PBS show, The Abolitionist, he yeah. left out David Walker entirely. Oh, and the movie Lincoln didn't mention Frederick Douglass or Tubman. And mm-hmm. uh, I was wondering, yeah, it had the whole focus on the hero was kind of Thaddeus Stevens, which is weird. Mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak about the role of representation and the media with breaking down Eurocentrism and global white supremacy. Yes, and that's an excellent question. The problem, I think the main problem in terms of the lack of representation within the media and popular culture, is that the people who create these projects that that are so um, ubiquitous, like Lincoln, like these other projects, is that the advisors that they choose are specifically people who have no interest and no, even maybe they don't even have the knowledge about the impact the significance, for example, of Frederick Douglass 
Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth on Lincoln's eventual um, policy towards, you know, the enslaved African Americans. They choose people who are completely removed from that actual history. They choose consultants who are so wedded to the myth of the, the omniscient white, in this case, politician, that it's not even within their it's not even within their capability to think of choosing someone who might bring an ounce of reality to Lincoln's political evolution. Like they, it's, it's so far removed from what they would even consider because mm-hmm. A, they don't know, they're ignorant of it, them, of it themselves in most cases. And then B, if the knowledge came to them, they might disregard it because they're so they're so focused on whiteness and the white savior complex, clearly, because that's what that movie Lincoln was about, Lincoln as the white savior, that if they came upon the information about Harriet Tubman's advisement of Lincoln, about Frederick Douglass's advisement of Lincoln, Sojourner Truth, if they came across it, they would say, well, who are they? They were just slaves. They couldn't have had any impact on this great white man's thinking. So the problem is twofold. The problem... On the one hand, is that they're ignorant of it. And then on the other hand, if they do get the information, they discount it. They dismiss it. And the representation is so very important on on several levels, but mainly it's important because we need accuracy. We need accuracy in these historical narratives. The accuracy, the veracity, the complexity of the story is so is so absent. And again, because there's, these consultants are so wedded and indeed so devoted to the idea of this superior whiteness that they can't even conceive of, they can't even conceive of a man or like Frederick Douglass or women like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman who had an influence on him. They can't even conceive that it is even worth mentioning or that it even had that their um, discourse and their dialogues with him were of any import. And so what happens is in the, because these films, you know, people take these Hollywood historical films as truth, as complete truth. And so then you have just the same recycling of the same false narratives over and over and over again, over and over again. So it's, yeah, it's a yeah. self-perpetuating cycle. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, these are these are narratives like public narratives or public yeah. histories, even like statues. And for people who don't have EBSCO or who don't who aren't scholars or educated in that way, this is this is their history, which forms exactly. this this ideology that's ongoing and very violent. Exactly, exactly. And it's sad because just like you're saying. If people don't have access to databases, I agree with you. It becomes highly problematic. But also the the larger impact of these films is that it just reinforces, in the case of mainstream American society, it reinforces that narrative. And then they think, well, I saw this movie. I got more information than I bargained for. But it's not different from what I already know. In anything, in any regard, it's just making me respect Lincoln even more. Even though they're getting a very small slice of of the real story about Lincoln, they they consider themselves edified from having viewed a film that is completely lacking in accuracy. So mm-hmm. it just becomes a a, a, a self perpetuating cycle, and that that's the problem. So then, yeah. So the problem with that's the problem is that the representation is non-existent, and then. We're dealing with an American public that, for the most part, comes out of the public school system, where, again, that history is not taught. So it's just, you know, when I talk, when I think about the work I have to do as an educator and sort of, you know, decolonizing the minds of my students, the work that I have to do and that many of us do is so um, labor intensive because they're not getting, the students are not getting any of this information. So when they get it, they're the shock. Their immediate response is, I can't believe I wasn't taught this. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I don't know this. So they first have to get over the shock, and then they have to absorb the information. 
And then they start really questioning and thinking critically about the educational system, about the fact that when we talk about white supremacy, you know, when, when they used to hear the words white supremacy, the only thing they would think of is the Ku Klux Klan. So, you know, in educating them, they have to come, they come to an appreciation that the Ku Klux Klan is just the tip of the iceberg, that white mm-hmm. supremacy is really woven within the society, culture, and politics of this country, and it's inextricable from the society, culture, and politics of this country. Because yeah. just on a basic level, they're not taught about the contributions of um, African Americans, people of color, women. And even when they're taught about the, the narrative about, for example, the suffragist movement, completely whitewashed. Never, never. They didn't learn anything. My students didn't even know Sojourner Truth's name. They didn't know her name. They didn't know who she was. Because all of, again, the educational system, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, those that's all they learn about. And they don't learn about the racism within first wave feminism. That many of those women, for example, Elizabeth Cady Stanton publicly declared that she will cut off her, this right arm of mine if the Negro gets the vote and not the woman. Okay, like they're not learning the, the in, any sort of intersectional analysis of American history. Of course they're not. A, because the content in, uh, in the public educational system in the courses has been, is, has been severely like cut. And then also the focus has gotten more and more conservative. For example, when I was in school, you know, in the 1970s, because we were on the heels of the Black Power Movement was still happening, there was a an outcry for more accuracy in the, um, again, in, of the rep- historical representation of people of color and black people in particular. And when I went to school, I grew up learning the basics. For example, that Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American woman to publish a volume of poetry. It was actually, I'll never forget, a picture of Phyllis Wheatley in my textbook and, you know, about her great accomplishments in, you know, in 1773 with her poems on uh, various subjects, uh, moral, religious and moral. And I learned that. And the other basic thing that we learned in school was that, you know, the, the slave owner gave their slaves their own, the slave owner's name to, to denote property. Those just those basics. And again, even that was not enough given the history of achievement of black people under the boot heel of white supremacist oppression during chattel slavery and all of the, the, the volumes of slave narratives that were written, the slave revolt. Granted, we didn't learn about all of them, but we did get some basic education about what the meaning of chattel was in terms of property and then the naming of the enslaved with the name of the slave owner. And at least, at least we learned about Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass, at least. Of course, they didn't talk about David Walker's appeal, too radical a document, but at least we got that basics. My students come in with no knowledge. They don't even, they can't even really tell you who Frederick Douglass was. Phyllis Wheatley, never heard of her. Sojourner Truth, never heard of her. Harriet Tubman, oh, you know, I think, you know, the Underground Railroad, but they can't tell you what the Underground Railroad was that it wasn't actually a railroad, that it was a network, um, a network of African Americans and European Americans or white Americans who helped the, enslave, uh, helped the enslaved on their journeys from the South, set up safe houses. They didn't know, they don't know the basics. So then here they, they, they get older and they go to the movies, they see a film like Lincoln, and then that's it. There it is. Yeah. yeah Things so are breaking you know, down. Yeah. And then, the, thankfully, you know, the movie Harriet was, I thought, you know, that was pretty well done. Um, and I can't remember if there was a scene with her and Lincoln. I don't think there was. It was William Lloyd It was an abolitionist gathering. It was oh, William Garrison. Lloyd Garrison. Yeah. Mm. So even that, that they, you know, they should have included a scene with, you know, Lincoln, you know, getting co- counsel, counsel from Frederick Douglass and from Harriet Tubman, because that's what he, he did, in fact, get counsel from them. Mm. But, Yeah. So by the time I get them on the college level, I mean, when I tell you in terms of the the labor intensity of getting them to understand white supremacy supremacy as something intrinsic to American culture, it's uh, it's an awakening for them, thank goodness, you know. But it's also, it's, 
it's challenging because they literally come in to the at least at Lehman, which is part of the City University of New York, a public institution. They come in from the New York City public school system, which is so broken. My sister's a public school teacher, so I can say this, you know, with great conviction and clarity. They're just not getting the content. Mm-hmm. Everything's teaching to the test, to the regents, and even that content is so watered down and so bereft of any sort of comprehensive unit on on people of color, on women. It's, I, I feel our educational system is failing. Public education is failing our students. It really is. Not only in terms of content, in terms of skill set. They're not learning grammar and vocabulary. They're not learning grammar and or e- even vocabulary. It's very, it's very disconcerting because when I think about public education when I was growing up versus what my students can do, I mean, when I was in junior high school, and high, junior high school in particular, I had a very strong vocabulary. And I say that because my students are coming in now with, without vocabulary skills I had in junior high school, and I'm not exaggerating. Some of them are better, but I, honestly, the, major, the majority of students are coming in not prepared at all. And it, it's, it's a shame because the lack of investment in urban public schools and urban, uh, urban public schools for students of color is it's shameful. Because there was a time, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, um, late 60s and early 70s, first of all, people, there was not the same kind of stigma attached to being working class as there is now. And part of that, the stigma that, that exists now and that's played out in popular culture, for example, on television and in the movies, there are very few movies now made about working class people, even sitcoms. Everyone has to be wealthy or, you know, for the most part. When I was growing up, there was, there was not this stigma. There was not this stigma attached to being working class. And within that, people who were working class still understood the value of education, the value of developing one's mind, the value of being able to engage with ideas and articulate yourself. People understood that knowledge was power. Now, with neoliberal capitalism and the rise of all, you know, the million, the, the millionaire, the, the young millionaire in the entertainment industry, young people don't value education the way they used to. They don't value it. Students now see education as a means of certification in many ways to get a degree that will get them a, a job in which they can be certified, and there's nothing wrong with that. But within that certification process is all about, okay, I just need to make money. I just need to make money. And part of that is fueled by neoliberal capitalism because of the, again, the the expanding gulf between the rich and the poor, that making a living is is paramount in their minds above all else because they're coming from their mired in a system that has been keeping them and their families in poverty. Yeah, and it's just been expanding since the seventies. This exactly. inequality. Exactly. I want to I want to focus in on David Walker for this question because I really mm-hmm. learned a lot from David Walker from your chapter. One thing that I wanted to quote, and you wrote in Article One, Walker critiques American slavery by asking readers to recall that even the ancient Egyptians did not degrade their Israelite slaves by declaring them less than human, a charge mm. that Jefferson so boldly defended in his notes. Mm. And I think something you point out so well of David Walker is his internationalism. Oh, yeah. He, he speaks of the indigenous in North and South America, the Irish mm-hmm. and Britain, the workers mm-hmm. in mines. He has a call to arms. He inspired Nat Turner's rebellion. Mm-hmm. And he even called for the entire emancipation of uh, enslaved brethren all over the world. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could break open David Walker more, uh, what mm-hmm. that documentary really missed by leaving him out, and just yeah. his calls for collective liberation. Yeah, that's a great question. David Walker, when I think of David Walker, I immediately think of the people he inspired, like Malcolm X, like the Panthers. And these were um, groups that became internationalists in their vision and in their program. So David Walker, because he was so learned and scholarly, 
he really was not only politically committed to the cause, but ideologically and philosophically invested in the cause of liberation because he saw the chattel slave system as so egregious, so egregious, not only physically in terms of brutality against enslaved people, but also ideologically. He saw he saw how the ideology of white supremacy was being meted out on the in terms of the lived reality of the enslaved, but also in terms of the production of ideas. And that's why he takes Jefferson to task, because he says that here is Thomas Jefferson, a man who is so learned, a man who is considered one of the great philosophers among the whites. Here is someone who is so learned, yet and despite or because of his learning, because of his Eurocentrism, is so invested, so invested in using his education, his philosophical gifts, He's so invested to using those gifts to further, further the degradation of black humanity. So he, when David Walker sees how white supremacy is being played out on the physical plane in terms of the plantation and the brutality, and then he also sees white supremacy being bolstered by people like Jefferson, thinkers who write books specifically devoted to furthering the cause of Euro-American hegemony, furthering the cause of black oppression. So he's reacting on two levels. He's reacting on the level of discourse, and he's reacting on the level of the, of, of the material, the lived reality. So that was, that's what makes him so powerful, is that he sees that the slavery system is creating in the, the rationalization of black oppression globally and in terms of the physical bonds of slavery and then the exchange of ideas, the discourse. So that's what makes Dave, that's what makes David Walker so, so very important is that I think he understood that if slavery was not abolished and overcome, that we would be living the reality we are right now. Because in the, in the appeal, he constantly and consistently uses italics and exclamation points because he's so indignant, is righteously indignant about the fact that the brutality that white people have decided to create this, use to create the system of cattle slavery, that the brutality of it, that the wanton murder and torture and rape of, 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 of slave women in particular, that this brutality is what binds their pockets with gold. He says that. In the appeal, he, he says very straightforwardly that they, their avarice, that the white uh, plantation owners' avarice, their lust for wealth, that all of that is, is, is used to brutalize and to deny the humanity of a group of people. That, it's, that at its heart, it's evil. And he cites the Bible. You know, he cites the Bible to prove his point. He cites the Bible. He cites these texts, you know, these different works of ancient hist historiography about different slave systems. And based on that, decides that we, the colored people of the United States, are the most abject, most degraded, most pitiful creatures on the earth. And he says the United States because that's his frame of reference. But he really talks throughout the appeal of enslaved black people throughout the Americas as well. And David Walker, this is another thing that's very important, is that David Walker and um, Denmark Vesey were very much aware of the Haitian Revolution. And they, they understood Haiti as to be a shining example in the Americas of what could be accomplished for black unity and using black unity to overthrow the shackles of, of slavery. So they saw Haiti as a shining example. And they also understood Haiti to be to be issuing sort of a, a, a clarion call to enslaved people in the United States. And they also believed that the Haitian revolutionaries would welcome enslaved people from the United States to join in this free republic 
this free black republic. So they very much had an inter the, the internationalist understanding of black um, enslavement, black oppression, and subsequently how black unity could overcome that is something that, again, is, needs to be emphasized in Walker's appeal in the 1800s. So the 1800s saw more slave revolts in the United States than, if I'm not mistaken, than any other time period. Um, when I say slave revolts, I mean systematically planned and executed, even though, for example, Gabriel Prosser's insurrection was foiled because of a traitor. We're talking about organized systems of communication done in great secrecy. Gabriel Prosser's was foiled, but then you had Denmark Vesey's insurrection, Nat Turner's. There was also the one of the, the largest um, slave revolt in um, Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken. That was that was something that was also CBS did do a good job on this. They reenacted um, a slave revolt, the largest slave revolt in Louisiana. And so we're talking about the 1800s with Walker's appeal really being such a, a, a fertile time for for planning rebellion, executing rebellion, and then also understanding rebellion within the context of the Haitian Revolution. You know, this is, I mean, when we think about how the ancestors were able to pull all of this off before social media, before the internet, before the telephone, it really has to impress upon people the natural human inclination towards freedom from bondage and the sophisticated networks of communication that they had to use. In many cases, they used the talking drum. This is where the oral tradition comes in. The talking drum was used, the singing of particular spirituals to signal when to revolt, all kinds of coded messages. For example, go down Moses, that spiritual, that was banned on plantations because the slave owners, it took them a while, but they caught on that, wait a minute, this, there, there's some kind of messaging going on here, an organization around the singing of songs. They didn't catch all of them, but Go Down Moses was one that was eventually became banned on the plantations. Go Down Moses was one, Steal Away, Steal Away, Steal Away, and then Swing Low Sweet Chariot. All of these songs were secret messages. That was the only way, when you think about it, that these messages of, of planning escape and or insurrection could be passed along. Then... And when Angela Davis wrote an excellent article, The Role of the Black Woman in the Community of Slaves. It's a 1970s article. But anyway, it's available on JSTOR, The Role of the Black Woman in the Community of Slaves. And she talks about the fact that the, the image of the slave woman has to be recuperated um, and, and valued. Because in the 1970s, uh, there was this whole attack on the so-called black matriarch. This was... Um, Hugh Carey, Senator Hugh Carey, launched an attack on the black matriarch and was blaming the poverty, the cycle of poverty on black women. And Angel Davis did a brilliant analysis calling out this, um, this sort of this attack on black womanhood and then connecting it to the history of slavery. So the black woman was always a target, not only of the slave owner's um, lust um, in terms of, you know, the wanton rape of black women, but the, but that the rape was also used to undermine slave unity and slave rebellion. And then, so she lays out that argument, and then she goes on to explain that um, slave women were instrumental in insurrections. She gives a brief history of different slave insurrections um, in New York, along in the East Coast, New York, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, and the number of slave women who were involved. And she does this by citing Herbert. Herbert Apsecker, who was a Marxist historian and did extensive research on the role of slave women in revolt. So I say all of this because Walker, when we think about Walker in the 1800s, he's very emblematic of the rise in incidents of slave revolt that took place in this country or, you know, in the aftermath of the Haitian Revolution. You know, he's emblematic of that. He's, and he's emblematic on the level also of his uh, engagement with the contemporary discourses of white supremacy, because he, called, he takes Jefferson to task 
Many other writers during that period, the Vindicationists in my book, that's how I describe them, mm-hmm. they, they're all critical of, you know, white supremacy in, in American letters. They're very critical of it. They're critical of pro-slavery positions. But Walker was the only one during that period called Jefferson out by name. He was fearless. And it's, that's the kind of fearlessness that inspired people like Malcolm X, that inspired the Panthers. Walker was very much um, someone who ins- I, I know he had to have inspired. But, his, I mean, Malcolm was so well-read. I mean, he read everything. Um, I know he read Walker's Appeal because he read he read all of the books. He read Douglas's um, autobiographies. He read all of the important texts of Black history. So I know he he had to have read Walker's Appeal. But it's that same sort of righteous indignation that how dare you, how dare you, how dare you on so many levels not only dehumanize us and degrade us, brutalize us. But then use all of that, all of those evil acts to line your pockets with wealth. It's like, it's like adding insult to injury. And he and he, David Walker, understood that not only were they creating a system of wealth for themselves, but at the same time, they were creating a canon. They were creating a canon of, of philosophical work to justify the oppression of black people. So they were doing two things. You know, they were creating an extensive resource of philosophical work to justify their evil act, and then at the same time using that discourse to rationalize the brutality, enslavement, exploitation, and murder of people. So Walker, you know, he he was he was a visionary. He was a visionary. I hope that answered your question. I know I went on for a bit. Oh, no, you answered that question greatly. Thank you. Thank you for just breaking that down. Oh, no problem. This uh, this next question kind of ties in your chapter on on uh, Camus, Brathwaite, and Fanon. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about the term or concept of decolonization. Mm-hmm. And when I spoke to Lewis Gordon, he said uh, decolonization is getting thrown around so much now that it needs to be decolonized. Uh-huh. And, and uh, it's very evident, even uh, Trudeau of so-called Canada, the prime minister, used the term recently. And mm. another term which has been used in a similar context is the term land back, which uh, Briar Patch magazine uh, just released a, a magazine with that title. That I really feel it gets right to the point of a point of decolonization. Mm-hmm. And when reading your chapter on uh, Camus' breath weight and, and renaming, his concept of renaming, mm-hmm. I thought about not only explicit renaming of landscapes that's going on right now in the renewed protests of Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. but renaming also the landscape by toppling statues, such right. as on Indigenous People's Day, the Lincoln statue came down, and other ones that have been uh, taken down by direct action recently. And I was wondering if you could speak on this. Hmm. Well, the thing about, um, I have to agree with what Lewis is saying in terms of that the term decolonized is being thrown around so much that it has to be decolonized. Um, and part of that, I think the reason that people are using it with such frequency is that it sounds, the, the, just using the word decolonized to them is a way of aligning themselves with liberatory or emancipatory politics. So it makes people feel good when they say we need to decolonize. But do they really understand what that entails? Mm -hmm. Um, To truly decolonize institutions and societies, it means we have to confront the 400-year legacy of Eurocentrism and uh, European hegemony and white supremacy. I say white supremacy last because when we think about white supremacy, the whole idea of whiteness is something that didn't really arise until, you know, the, the, in particular, with the first wave of European immigrants coming to this country and being um, indoctrinated into a system in which blackness or black people were seen as anathema to American identity. So whiteness is a created identity that 
even poor whites had to aspire to. And when I say poor whites, I mean poor white people who were farmers, sharecroppers, et cetera, in the South in particular in the 1800s, had to become invested in a system of white supremacy. And remember, this is a system that is in place created by planters with money. So how do you get white pe- poor white people invested into this? You, you tell, they, you, they have to understand that their investment into the system comes with um, a benefit, which is that even though they're poor, they're not black. They're not, they're not the, the distinct other, the enslaved, okay? So whiteness is an identity. I say white supremacy last because that is a consequence of Eurocentrism and European hegemony, and if you will, European capitalist hegemony, if you want to be more specific. So to de- truly decolonize is you have to confront, we're talking about a very, a, a, a centuries-old ideology and centuries-old practices of glorifying whiteness, if you will, well, whiteness last, but European identity and Euro- Eurocentrism. So when I think when Lewis says we have to decolonize the term decolonize, he means that we have to, we have to engage in serious discussions about the history of colonial settler, settler colonialism in this country, European um, colonialism in general across the globe. And this is something that most people who throw around the term are not really aware of. Do so, you know what I'm saying? Like they feel, mm-hmm. I feel like they, their conscience, they can assuage their conscience if they, if they say, well, I think we need decolonial education. Okay, but would they really still say that if if they knew that decolonial education meant really upending and subverting this Eurocentric, the Eurocentrist ideal that is at the heart of Western letters and West, the history of Western ideas? Would they still say that if it meant okay? You you shouldn't teach don't don't teach Aristotle anymore Aristotle's writings on slavery anymore instead teach Frederick Douglass would they still say that would they be opening to understanding Frederick Douglass's work his entire oeuvre as a contribution to the history of ideas and to um, anti-slavery um, discourse and to a challenge um, a challenge to the epistemic the epistemological importance of, for example, the American school ethnologist, which is who Douglas directly challenged in his speech, the claims of the Negro ethnologically considered. Would they still say we need decolonial education if it meant teaching the black vindicationists at, and, you know, instead of John Locke and, you know, these others that I mean, and David Hume, you know, would, would they still say it if it meant, valorizing the ideas of people of color, of women, of the enslaved. Would they still say that? So I think what Lewis is pointing to is that people's awareness of what an actual decolonial education and decolonizing project would look like is not even consistent with the reality of it. That it kind of gets thrown around maybe as a as a performative morality, that, that term. There it is. Yeah. That's, exact, that's very well said, exactly. The perf- perf- performative morality, you know, utterance, exactly. It makes people feel good. Do they know what it really means, what it really entails? It's a, lot of, it's, a lot of responsibility behind that word to mean exactly. it truly. A lot of responsibility behind it and really completely changing and exposing people to the ways in which they've been taught um, that are so, um, that are dangerous, that are fallacious. And it's really, really a way of, it's a true decolonial education would completely upend the way we understand the history of ideas and the history of Western societies. It would upend it. And do, are people ready for that? I, I mean, I, I believe that some people are, but I think most, a lot of people throw, up, throw around the term would be shocked at their own level of ignorance. Yeah, even if they would be able to 
um, be honest about the etymology of philosophy being um, not a Greek word, but, yeah. but to a tight word and it, like a comedic word when it goes back, even if they'd be able to accept that. Exactly. See, you just hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Are they really ready to confront? Are they really ready to confront the historical, the historical, the egregious historical lives that we've all been forced to? Are they really ready to do that? Are they really ready to question their entire, their entire social and political reality because of that awareness? Thank you for breaking that open. No, no problem. Well, I think one thing you've really been talking about, I'm going to quote you here with the the ideological structures of colonialism. Indeed, colonialism's very survival demands a complete eradication of Native culture, history, citizenship, and language, and the replacement of these with European systems of culture, history, citizenship, and language. Mm -hmm. And I think you've you really been speaking to this, like when you were talking about the spirituals and how those were banned. And you also have written about how plantation owners banned African rituals. Yeah. But uh, African rituals actually contributed to Christianity um, when they mixed together. Okay. But these rituals were banned. Mm -hmm. And um, then you look at indigenous boarding schools were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1920s, the U.S. banned indigenous dances. Mm -hmm. And now we see this ongoing to children being imprisoned on the border to That's mass right. hysterectomies by ICE, That's to right. even just something that's still very violent, just this Eurocentric curriculum that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could speak on this this legacy of this, but also on the other end, like the, sur the survivance, the survival and resistance of this, and mm. maybe organizations, movements, or trends you're seeing right now that are fighting to break these structures. Mm. That's a good question. Um, yeah. The thing is, is that when we think about how pernicious these white supremacist practices are, we definitely have to see them in a historical context. Because when we talk about the sterilization of women in the detention centers, all of that, all of those, those brutal practices are, you know, just another form of eugenics. And this is, they, these eugenics practices date back uh, you know, to the 1800s, at least. We have to understand them as part of a genocidal campaign against indigenous people, people of color in this country, because that's what ultimately these, these people who practice sterilization on women without their consent are aiming to uh, control the populations of people of color and eliminate the populations. They're contributing to a uh, plan, a genocidal plan that would eliminate our numbers from the population. And yes, there's been, there, there's been consistent resistance against, you know, these practices. The problem, though, is that when in these ICE centers in particular, when we talk about what's been happening lately, is that the women are anesthetized. They go in for a simple procedure, perhaps, and they get anesthetized. And then the doctors, that's when they, you know, go forward with their plan to sterilize them. So if a woman in a detention center, for example, needs an appendectomy, she needs her appendix taken out because she's in, maybe the appendix has ruptured or she's in extreme pain and the appendix, you know, is an organ that's not really necessary, she has to get it removed. So during that procedure, she's, she's put under anesthesia and then that's it. With this, that she loses, the, she's lost the ability to advocate for herself because she's unconscious. So, whoever, when we think about the the directives um, and the instructions being the instructions being followed at these detention centers, these come from the high up. They come from the from the White House. They come from the you know we're talking about the federal government is aware of these practices and they've sanctioned them. So. Yeah, they're definitely, we have to understand them as part of a genocidal campaign to eliminate our numbers. In the same way that we have to understand um, the, the, the wanton police murders of unarmed black people and Latinx people also within a program of genocide. We have to, we have to see them that way. Because no, first of all, these are state-sanctioned killings. 
There's little to no accountability. The police officers involved, are, they, are not, they are not murdering unarmed white people by any stretch of the imagination. You know, there was a clip on the news the other day when uh, I think it was on MSNBC, and um, I think it was Ari Melber's show, The Beat. Uh, he was just supposing the arrest of Daniel Prude in Rochester, an African-American man who died in police custody, was brutalized and suffocated, mentally ill man. The family had called to get help because he was, you know, he, he erratic. His behavior was erratic. And he was killed. The police killed him. Um, I remember just because those images of Daniel Prude being brutalized by the police, suffocated with a plastic bag, to the image um, and the news footage of a white man who was mentally ill. Um, and the police, you know, the police let him run around. He was running around naked. They let him run around. They let him scream and carry on. They were laughing at him, thinking it was amusing. And he, he randomly... Um, he just started beating up an, an innocent bystander, a, a black man who was an innocent bystander, beating up the black man, and they did nothing to stop him. So we have to see that, you know, these state-sanctioned acts of murder, sterilization, as part of part of a genocidal plan, because they are. That's exactly what they are. You, can, you, can, you control a population by making women sterile. You control a population by murdering people who, are, who have not committed a crime. The thing is, there's also a report, I think it was the Brennan Report that came out not long ago. I think it was in September it came out. The Brennan Report did a study on the numbers of police officers who were in, affiliated with or in white supremacist groups like the Klan, Aryan Nation. They put out a report on it. And it's well known that in law enforcement, there's a huge, it's not even a cabal anymore. They're not even a secret group. They're at the fort, they're in the front lines, literally, and their, their task is to murder as many black people as possible. And this has not, this has not even been publicized. Why, mm -hmm. hasn't this, why hasn't this been on the news? Everyone's, you know, Black Lives Matter is very important and all of the work they're doing. But if we're really going to talk about really undermining white supremacy, then this report needs to be made public. The Brennan Report on White Supremacy in Law Enforcement needs to be made public, um, and not just on WBAI, which is Pacifica Radio, and that's what the left, you know, Pacifica, mm -hmm. a radical, right? Not just yep. on BAI, but it should be on MSNBC, it should be on ABC, CB, it should be on every channel. If we're really going to take seriously this charge that we need to out to undermine white supremacy, then we, this is one of the major things we can do is deal with their, the numbers of avowed white supremacists in law enforcement. They're there, and they've made themselves known. I've seen so many reports. I saw another report on, this was one of the Facebook posts, where one of the cops, one of the cops posted a letter saying, that's right, we've got we to kill them all. And they were talking about black people. Kill them oh, all. Yeah, that, and then the, the radios that were, uh, they left their radios on. Yep, that's on, on Some other reports, yeah. Yep. So the resistance, look, the resistance, is, and the thing is, is the resistance is really important. And the marching and the protesting is really important. Um, but there, there are other things we need to do as well. And one of those things is to get this Brennan report out on more media outlets. That's, that's one thing that we really, that's, I think that's very, very pressing. I just think the information, there's more information that needs to be disseminated amongst the public. That's one of the things I think is really, really pressing. Um, and as far as the historical resistance, I agree with you that I think these young people in Black Lives Matter need more exposure to the history of Black resistance, the Black struggle. For example, one of the T-shirts that some of the Black Lives Matter protesters are wearing, one of them says, we are not our ancestors. We will fuck you up. You know the implication is there that the ancestors didn't, didn't do it. Didn't resist with didn't resist with um, self defense or didn't resist with weapons. Didn't resist with with um, you know violent means, and that's that's just not the case. The history of slave revolts in this country, the history of Nat Turner's revolt, the history of poisoning. Poisoning was another tool used by the enslaved to to retaliate against the brutality 
the, the, the young people today are not aware of the history of resistance that has gone on before Black Lives Matter. Most of them aren't. And I know because they tell me in class. They assume, and this is the faulty reasoning, and they're not completely to blame. Part of it's the educational system that we just talked about. But some of it's the faulty reasoning that, oh, we're still fighting this battle because our ancestors didn't hack it. That's the subtext of that T-shirt. We are not our ancestors. We'll fuck you up. The subtext is that the ancestors are passive and that, oh, we're still doing this. We're still fighting these struggles because they couldn't beat it. And that's the ignorance. When we talk about, when we talk about the, the, the common everyday logic, the culture, the politics, when we talk about the fact that everything in the United States and in many Western culture, cultures is built upon the logics of black oppression, black subjugation, and black dehumanization, for, and we're talking about a four centuries long project, they don't understand the enormity of that. They don't understand that it's built, with, it's, literally, it's literally woven into every strand of society, culture, and politics, and that undermining and overturning and subverting that kind of system is a lifelong project. We're talking about the entire modern world um, in terms of, you know, West, the Euro modern world, as Lewis likes to call it, built on, literally built on, the radical dehumanization, the criminalization, the demonization of black people. So undoing that is not a one-generation project. It's not a two-generation project. It is a centuries-long project. We are still fighting because that which we are fighting is, when we talk about hegemony, hegemonic in the sense that it's part of the, the logic and, and general understanding of what this American culture is. The reason more white people are, are not against Trump is because they really do believe that someone like Breonna Taylor, who's asleep in her own house, deserved to die. They, don't under, they, they can rationalize and justify an innocent woman be, who was an essential worker, no less, a paramedic, being asleep in her own house and being her home being invaded by cops with a no-knock warrant and being killed in her sleep. They can, they can justify that because everything in the American culture, everything in the American culture verifies that black people are inherently criminal and she had to have been doing something wrong. If she didn't do something wrong, oh, well, She's just dead. It's just a mistake. It doesn't matter. Because our lives have been systematically devalued for centuries that people are desensitized, completely desensitized to the suffering of black people. They think that the system can't be wrong, so we must be wrong. And Lewis talks about this in, when he talks about theodicy, you know, that black people are presented as a problem in this system because the system is valorized to the point that it can't be wrong, that we have to be the ones at fault. Even when we're innocent, we're at fault. And thank you for breaking that down and, and tying in this, this legacy of, of white supremacy, but also this legacy of resistance and survival and uh, it just agency of the whole, the whole narrative of this discussion. So thank you for that. No problem. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. I want to thank Dr. LaRose Paris for taking the time to speak to me and share her knowledge, stories, scholarship, and experiences. Please support her work and get her book being a part. Thank you to Awareness for the music. Please share the show, support it on Patreon, and thank you all for the support.